everyone, welcome to my channel, RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and talk about how you might use them in your current campaign. This week I'm going way back to 1978, though incorrect copyright lists it as 1979, to Module B1, In Search of the Unknown. Written by TSR Luminary Mike Carr, In Search of the Unknown was included in the 4th through 6th printing of the Holmes Basic Set, replacing the Dungeon Geomorph Set 1 and Monster and Treasures Assortment Set 1 that had been included with the rules up to that point. As a side note, the 7th and 8th printing of the Holmes Basic Set would include B2, Keep on the Borderlands. Mike Carr is probably best known for his World War I aerial combat game, Fight in the Skies, or Dawn Patrol and Give Up the Ship, which he co-authored with Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. Carr was also the editor of the first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual, Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, as well as many of the early game's classic modules. In Search of the Unknown details a hidden complex known as the Caverns of Quas Clinton, and is intended as an instructional module and an introduction for new dungeon masters in creating their own adventures in dungeons. Uniquely to this module only due to its instructional nature, the monsters and treasure in the rooms are intentionally left blank for the new DM to fill in and make the adventure their own. Quick spoiler warning, I will be revealing some of the module's more interesting encounters and secrets, so if you would like to play in this adventure, I'd advise you to point your DM in this direction, but stop at this point. Still with me? Okay, let's get started. The module begins with the neophyte characters looking to make a name for themselves and gather riches as adventurers in a Dungeons & Dragons fantasy world. In the first printing of the module, that was the world of Greyhawk, but that reference was removed in later printings. The adventure revolves around the exploration of the stronghold of the two famous and legendary adventurers and heroes, Rogan the Fearless, a powerful warrior, and Zeligar the Unknown, a magic user of great power. Having made a name for themselves as legendary adventurers before the birth of the player characters, they are best known for how they helped fend off a barbarian horde from the lands of the north. Joining the battle along with their band of loyal henchmen, the two heroes were instrumental in staving off the barbarian invasion and saving the homeland of the player characters. Now considered true heroes of the realm, the two friends and heroes return to their secret stronghold of Quasquentin for a time before enjoining on a foray to the north to end the barbarian threat once and for all. Sadly, however, it is believed that this is where the legendary hero's story ends, apparently having met their demise at the hands of the barbarians. Of course, rumors of the secret lair of these two heroes, a massive underground complex filled with the magical treasures they had accumulated over their lifetime persist. The module begins with one of the neophyte PCs in possession of a map that is said to lead to this legendary stronghold. If these new, young heroes could uncover the treasures within, surely they too could become legendary heroes like Rogan and Zeligar. The module spends a good five pages on instructing the new dungeon master on how to conduct adventures, divide experience points, keep track of time, and how to be an effective referee. As with other adventures of this time, a group of rumors, some true, some misleading, are provided as well. Two levels for Quas Quentin are provided. The upper level is your standard maze-like dungeon complex, while the second level is a natural cave system, thus demonstrating the two most common types of adventure locales. One of the more annoying aspects of the monochrome cover version is that the rooms are numbered using Roman numerals. In the 1981 reprint with the Darlene cover, 
the standard Arabic numerals are used. Now, while the module leaves the exact contents of the room, such as monsters and treasure, entirely up to the dungeon master, a definitive wandering monsters table is provided, as well as hefty, multi-paragraphed, detailed room descriptions. Many of the tricks and traps described are finally remembered by those players whose first experience with the D&D game was this module. When the heroes find the entrance to the place, the entry door has already been pried open, which should give them pause and to realize that other creatures may have found their way into Quas Quentin's massive halls. This is further reinforced when, at the end of the long entry hall, the bodies of five adventurers are found. This is also really the first place a DM has to present their very own encounter. What exactly brought about the demise of these adventurers? The module leaves this detail up to the DM. Goblins? Orcs? Kobolds? Or something more sinister? Even for experienced DMs, customizing the module to suit their tastes can be a lot of fun. I'd also like to point out that while Mike Carr really does a great job in describing the details of how the various rooms look, this module does not use the box text that would become the standard in later modules, so the DM will have to be familiar with the rooms so as not to inadvertently give away secret details of the room's contents. Given the time frame of the module's release, with AD&D's complete release still about a year off and its use with the home's basic set, which was heavily based on original D&D, there is some insight on how original D&D Dungeon Masters employed character statistics, even though the game at the time didn't really provide bonuses for such things as strength, other than XP bonuses for prime requisites. Throughout the module, ad hoc systems are employed to account for the ability scores of the characters. For example, when a trap drops a character in a cold pool of water, it says, the pool is about 8 feet deep, characters heavily encumbered with more than 50 coins of weight or equivalent will risk drowning unless they free themselves of the bulk and wait after landing in the water. If any character heavily encumbered does not, he or she will have a 90% chance of drowning modified by a minus 5% per point of dexterity. For instance, a heavily encumbered character who elects not to unencumber and has a dexterity of 12 will only have a 30% chance of drowning. The example is 90% minus 12 times 5% equals 30%. They did serious maths in these old school modules, didn't they? I like to also point out rooms 14 and 15, which are identical teleport rooms, with the idea being that the characters would teleport to the other identical room without knowing it. In the days when you weren't using battle mats or virtual tabletops, and the dungeon was drawn on graph paper in real time as the DM described it, the sudden transport to an identical room that is turned 90 degrees and 20 feet away would certainly play havoc with the player's map. Of course, with battle mats and virtual tabletop play, the effect is somewhat diminished. For the most part, the upper stronghold, despite its labyrinthine nature, follows a certain internal logic. There is an entry hall with traps for intruders. There are the bedrooms of Zeligar and Rogan, Rogan's mistress, Melissa, the captain of the guard, a barracks, a throne room, storage areas, the magical workshop of Zeligar, a target practice range for warriors, and so on. Then there is the Room of Pools. The exact reason for this room is really not explained, though 14 pools are here containing everything from acid to water. Drinking the liquid in some of the pools will heal or help a PC, while others will have more detrimental effects. It's classic early D&D fun, and it's probably one of the more famous and memorable rooms of the place. The lower second level is a bit more quirky. A cavern complex exploration of this lower level will reveal an unfinished museum, a cavern of bats, an unfinished combat arena, and a weird cavern of mystical stone. Apparently, if the characters break off a piece of the mystical stone and eat one of the chips, a magical effect occurs. The effect is completely random, and why a character would even think to break off a piece and eat it is not explained. However, if the PC does this, the DM rolls a d20 to see what happens. 
While there are a few detrimental effects, most are beneficial, with some being permanent ability score increases, gaining of a magic item, or what have you. I'll be honest, I really love these sorts of zany things myself, and this certainly typifies the kinds of weird encounters one might come across in old school adventures. The cover art for the original monochrome cover of In Search of the Unknown is pretty iconic, and at first glance, one familiar with early TSR artists might simply attribute it to David Sutherland, though as it turns out, this cover art has a rather interesting backstory. The first thing indicating its peculiarity is the unusual artist's signature, Dis and Dat. The backstory for this is revealed in the Goodman Games' recent release of Into the Borderlands, but quite a few of us got wise to this as well when, back in 1982, a piece of old David Trampier art was published as an afterthought of artistic filler in issue number 5 of Polyhedron Magazine, as shown here. Then here are the two pieces side by side. According to interviews with Mike Carr, he had commissioned a piece on the cave room depicting giant mushrooms, as that would look mysterious and exotic. But Trampier's initial piece was considered a bit too cartoony. Frank Menser speculates that they also wanted something that would look good on the shelves of Sears Roebuck. Thus Sutherland was tapped to see what he could do with it, and the conglomerate piece was used. In comparing the two pieces, most of Trampier's weird mushroom garden art was used, and Sutherland's more realistic-looking figures replaced Trampier's cartoony ones, though they are essentially of the same type, a wizard, a warrior, and a demi-human, though Sutherland also added an additional warrior character. In 1981, B1 was updated to reflect TSR's new trade dress, and the front and back cover art was redone again the front art still depicting the mysterious giant mushroom room, but this time an absolutely beautiful color piece is provided by Greyhawk map artist Darlene. The back cover art for the monochrome cover was done by David Sutherland, and it depicts the briefly mentioned hilltop tower overlooking Quas Quentin. The tower itself is not detailed in the module, but in 2018 when Goodman Games updated both modules for the fifth edition of the game, they added the Lonely Tower, which further details the final fates of the heroes Rogan and Zeligar, as well as the tragic story of Rogan's mistress Melissa. I did a review on Into the Borderlands a few months ago. Please go ahead and check it out. In the 1981 redress, the back cover art is also done by Darlene, depicting a combat between some lizard men. The interior artwork for both the 1978 and the 1981 release is David Sutherland's. The quality of Sutherland's work here varies with some looking rather amateurish, while others are vivid, well-done pointillism renditions. The scene depicting the magical pool room is a classic old-school piece. In addition to the update to B1 for the fifth edition of the game done by Goodman Games for Into the Borderlands, the classic Modules Today series on DMs Guild is also available for just a dollar. I'd also like to direct you to John Pinter's Realistic Map Series, where he updates classic old-school module maps for use on virtual tabletops like Fantasy Grounds and Roll20. I'm absolutely in love with his work on Quas Quentin and the caverns below. Matching Mike Carr's vivid room descriptions to a T, John really brings this classic dungeon to life with his colorful, artistic renditions of the adventure's maps. As you can see here, the maps just look gorgeous, and for only $3.99, they are an absolute bargain. I can't recommend John's work highly enough. Getting a copy of In Search of the Unknown has never been easier. The module is available for print-on-demand and PDF for only $9.99. You get the monochrome cover with the Roman numerals rather than the revised Darlene version, but as you can see here with this copy that I purchased, it looks quite good, though uh, I would also like to get a copy of the 1981 revised version as well. With the increased popularity of Dungeons & Dragons, classic old-school modules like In Search of the Unknown have really gotten quite expensive on eBay. I know only a few years ago, a copy like new of this module was going for $10 or $15. 
it was easy to get. Now a good quality original copy will run you between $20 and $50. In my opinion, that's just too much for a module that saw as large a print run as this one. Though, given the nature of the thing, getting an original module where someone hasn't already filled in the encounters is probably getting hard to find. Best to just get a POD copy from the DMs Guild. Maybe two. That way you can go ahead and just write your encounters in the module as originally intended and not feel guilty about it. However, you decide to get this module, whether you're running for a group of brand new D&D players or some grognards looking to revisit a classic adventure, in search of the unknown is certain to provide hours of adventure and fun, though as mentioned it will require quite a bit of preparation before you can run it. The rooms are well described, but since there is no box text, you'll have to be careful not to reveal too much to your players. Also, the quirky random funhouse nature of some of the encounters is not for everyone. For that reason, my D20 rating for this module is a solid 14. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you found this video interesting and informative. I've got quite a few videos in the queue, including a Fantasy Grounds tutorial. I also have my Patreon launch video coming out as well with some fun contests. And I'd like to give a big shout out to my first two Patreons, Eric Martin and Max Brico. If you'd also like to help support the channel, a link is in the description. Thank you so much for your support. Please like and subscribe. Don't forget to click the little bell so you'll get notifications when I post new videos. And as always my friends, may your d20 roll true and game on.